Uh, thanks, guys. So I'm going to talk about scalable development environments today. Uh, my name is Jordan. Uh, I work for a company called Game Changer. We're a platform for amateur sports. Uh, we work on a lot of interesting technical pro uh, problems. So um, you guys should apply to come work for us. Um, all right, here's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, development, development environments. Uh, basically, what are they? How do they work? Um, you know, what do I want them to do? Uh, then I'm going to talk about scaling development environments. So what does that actually like, mean to scale your development environment? Uh, why do you want to do that? Um, and I'm going to talk about what some of the problems you encounter are when you try to scale your local development environment. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about why containers uh, have some properties that make them an interesting and kind of like a, a good solution for this like, local development environment problem. So development environments, um, what are they? Uh, what do we want them to do? Um, let's, let's get an introduction to these things. So um, the concept behind development environments is pretty simple. Basically, you just want a place where you can run your code as you're developing it. You know, this is something that we all need to do as developers. Um, so this is probably something on your local computer that's like really accessible, easy for you to use so that you can observe the results of your code as you're writing it. Um, so what do we need them to do um, to accomplish this? Well, obviously, we need them to run our code. Uh, that's the whole purpose here. And we want to be able to observe the behavior of this code uh, as we run it. And you know, because we're developers, we're going to change our code and iterate on the behavior of this code and run it again. Um, and you know, as part of this process, we're probably going to be installing dependencies, installing uh, shared libraries for our code um, to, you know, develop our applications. So let's look at an example of a development environment, and it can actually be just as simple as like a Python interpreter and a text editor. Um, so a Python interpreter can do, you know, the things we talked about. It can run your code, you know, you can change your code, you can run it again. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, and this is actually a development environment that works really well for simple applications. You know, there's nothing complicated about it, but it does the job in a lot of cases. Um, as you guys can probably imagine, this solution doesn't actually scale very well. And once you kind of get into more complex use cases, you'll run into a lot of problems. So let's kind of explore that a little bit. Um, let's try developing with our, you know, our very simple environment. So we're going to develop some example Python application. Let's just call it myapp.py. It can be like you know whatever kind of Python application you choose. Um, and so yeah, so let's say we have this application myapp.py, and we want to add some functionality to it. Um, let's say we want to give it the ability to make HTTP requests. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to install the request library. Um, you know, say we use pip. You know, we can use a variety of things. Uh, we want to use the request library in our code, and then we can you know, run my app. And sweet, we've installed requests. Everything works. This is uh, going well so far. Um, so far, just using the Python interpreter has been fine for us. Um, but this was really just a, a very like, small contained like, use case for how we develop code. You know, it's just one Python application that I've been considering. Um, but Really, in our development environments, you know, we want to do a lot more than that. Um, let's think about scaling a little bit uh, and what happens when we try to run like, multiple applications uh, on our local environment. Um, so the, the first kind of like, example of scaling that we're going to do is we're simply just going to try running two Python applications at the same time. So we're still going to run you know, my app with you know, request install, doing whatever it does. Uh, we're also going to use um, my coworker Alex's app that he gives me the code for. Um, I also want to be able to run that on my local development environment. Um, so let's see what happens. Um, so if you remember like the steps that I performed uh, with my application, you know I used pip to install requests. Um, if I you know show the information about the installed version of requests, um, you know it's 2.8.1, which is the most recent version, so that's good. Um, but the code that uh, my coworker Alex gave me uh, for his application. You know, he specifies a requirements file saying you know, the different libraries that his application needs to, to run and the different versions of those libraries 
but he has a different version of requests specified in his application. And this is like a pretty standard common problem that you'll encounter as you're developing multiple Python applications side by side. Um, so, you know, with this conflicting version of requests, you know, we can't run both of these applications as is. So, I mean, there's a bunch of ways we could try and solve this. A lot of them aren't great. You know, we could avoid running both applications because they conflict. Um, we don't want to do that. Uh, you know, we could change um, the required version of the libraries of the applications so that they require the same version of the library. But really, we don't want to have to do that because that might require um, going through the code of you know, one of our applications to you know, change a lot of different things to support a different version of a library. So that's a process that can actually be kind of involved and like annoying to do uh, in complex applications. And as you guys can probably imagine, uh, that approach to resolving conflicts um, you know, is time consuming. It doesn't necessarily scale very well. Um, so the option that we're going to choose here is to improve our development environment so that uh, we can leave our different applications as they are um, and still be able to run them at the same time on our local computer. Um, so if we take a, a look at the way our, our environment looks right now, uh, before we've improved it, um, we have you know, my application, we have Alex's application, and they're using this shared version of the request library um, you know, within our environment. And if you think about what the real problem here is with this strategy, it's that these applications aren't isolated. Um, they share this system state that needs to support both applications. Um, and if you think about increasing the number of applications that we run on our local environment, you kind of like, the number of relationships between your n applications that you have running on your environment um, that must all be compatible is like order of n squared, where n is the number of your, your applications. You have that many relationships that all need to be compatible with each other. Um, whereas if our applications were perfectly isolated and they didn't depend on any shared system state, you know, we'd really have zero of these relationships that would need to be compatible. So that would be like obviously a much more scalable uh, approach to doing this. Um, so let's talk about this thing called virtual ends. Um, virtual ends are awesome. I hope most of you guys have used them. Um, they're a great uh, Python tool for isolating a Python runtime environment. Um, and they're largely designed to solve specifically the problem that we just saw, where we have two Python applications, they need to use a different version of some library. Um, a virtual env can isolate a Python application into its own specific environment that's local to that application. So it'll use uh, an installed version of the library that it needs, which is specific to its virtual env. So in this way, we can isolate our Python applications. Um, so um, yeah, you can see here that you know, my app, Alex's app, we each have our own separate virtual env. We have our isolated version of requests and any other uh, Python libraries that we need to be isolated. So this works really well so far. Um, virtual ems are a great way to do this for Python applications. Uh, but let's talk about scaling again. So far, this has still been like a pretty you know, contained use case. You know, we've just been using two Python applications. We could use virtual ems to scale to many Python applications. But unfortunately, sometimes we need to run code that isn't Python code. Um, so yeah, you need to, I guess the use case I wanna kind of like present here is like um, the, the trend of like microservices where suddenly people start to want to use like a bunch of different um, services. You know, they might be written in different languages, they might use different databases. They wanna run like a ton of different things in their stack. And if you want to be a developer for a stack that uses all those things, you need to be able to run all of these different kinds of code and all of these databases locally on your machine. So this is like the next form of scaling I'm going to talk about. We want to run, be able to run more applications, and we want to be able to run um, you know, more different languages, you know, more databases. <clears throat> 
So if you think about like the, the environment that we've been working with so far, uh, we have our Python applications, and they're isolated in virtual environments, and that works really well for Python. But you can imagine that there might be similar conflicts between you know, different apps that we're also running in, in different languages, like maybe um, you know, our node apps conflict somehow, or our databases conflict. Um, so we need a more general solution than virtual ends to solve this isolation problem, since they are a Python-specific thing. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, virtual machines. Um, virtual machines are um, ver a very, isolate, very isolated compared to uh, virtual environments. You know, they isolate an entire operating system running virtually. So if you contain each of your applications to a virtual machine, um, suddenly each of your applications has perfect isolation. Um, and this is like a really like general way to be able to run you know, any language that you need. Since it's an entire operating system, you're not confined to running a specific language like you are with virtual environments. Um, also with virtual machines, you have nice, um, or there's at least one nice tool uh, called Vagrant, which is uh, specifically a development environment tool which manages you, your virtual machines with the use case of a development environment in mind. So virtual machines have some uh, nice properties which give us this isolation in a general way that we didn't have with virtual environments. Um, of course, there are some drawbacks to using virtual machines to do this. Um, the first drawback here is that virtual machines are uh, very expensive in terms of your system resources. Um, and you have to remember that since this is a local development environment, this is something that we want to be able to run, like, say, on our laptop. So we don't have, like, unlimited um, RAM or CPU or anything like that. And when you're running an entire operating system for each app that you're using, suddenly the RAM usage of your development environment really starts to pile up. So if you envision kind of a, a microservice architecture where maybe you need to run many, many different services at the same time on your uh, local computer to develop effectively. Running each in a virtual machine is, um, is not gonna work. It's just too expensive. Uh, but it turns out that running an entire operating system for each of your applications is overkill because generally applications that you're developing don't need to be isolated at the operating system level. It's very unusual for um, some kind of like shared um, kernel stuff to mess up applications. So let's talk about containers. Um, so what are containers? So you could describe a container as kind of being like a, a packaged, bundled uh, runtime environment for some arbitrary application. Um, so a container bundles up a lot of stuff like dependencies, uh, a bunch of configuration, file system, uh, binaries, libraries, uh, you name it. Basically, anything in user land it can be bundled into a container. Um, you can kind of think of them like virtual ends, um, you know, if you're not familiar with containers, um, in that they, you know, they're designed to isolate uh, a program that's running in a specific space but really they isolate the entire user space. They, isolate, they do a much better job at isolating than virtual environments. And they do it in a much more general way. So containers are not like limited to a specific language. Um, yeah, and for those of you who have like heard of Docker but aren't super familiar with containers, Docker is like one form of a uh, kind of container that is uh, especially popular to use. Um, so if you look at what a bundled app looks like inside a container, uh, just as an illustration, uh, you know, we could bundle um, you know, my app into a Docker container, and the, all of this stuff exists specific to the, the container of my application. So I'll get my Python um, executable, you know, all the Python libraries that I need, a uh, whole file system, uh, system libraries, environment variables, like all this stuff. 
So let's um, get a comparison of the isolation that these different things we've talked about provide. So virtual environments uh, provide us with an isolated Python environment and the Python de dependencies uh, necessary for that environment. Uh, containers actually isolate the entire user space, um, you know, including file system um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And virtual machines isolate an entire virtual uh, operating system and kernel. Uh, so hopefully that's a, a clear comparison. Um, so if we think about it in, in the context of how they can be used for uh, development environments, uh, we can see that containers are more general and more isolated than virtual environments, so that's good. And containers, when you compare them to virtual machines, they have way less overhead, and therefore they're a lot more scale, scalable on a local system uh, if you need to run many different kinds uh, of apps. So containers occupy this kind of like nice uh, middle ground that might, in theory, be really nice uh, to take advantage of for a local development environment. Um, so there are some, some drawbacks to, uh, to maybe like attempting to use containers in this way. Uh, first of all, uh, widespread use of technologies like Docker is still like fairly young, so uh, the ecosystem is a little bit immature compared to some other tools. And um, the reason I say that is, uh, for example, there isn't like a widespread tool um, which leverages containers to use for your local development environment. Uh, like, for example, Vagrant exists for virtual machines. So that's kind of like um, an obstacle in the way of using a container for a local development environment. Uh, another problem for uh, some people, like uh, at Game Changer where we make a uh, iPhone app, is that there's no OSX support for uh, containers. And it's kind of a pain to run these containers on uh, Mac. What you actually end up doing is you run a, a Linux virtual machine, and then on that virtual Linux virtual machine, you can run the containers that you need. But that gets like a little bit messy. Uh, you know, it's not ideal to have to do that. Um, so yeah, that's a drawback to trying to use containers in this way. Um, so at Game Changer, we decided that containers were a good fit for this problem, and we wanted to take a crack at using them for our local development environment. So what we did is we, um, we made a piece of software called Dusty to, to attempt to like fill this niche in the Docker ecosystem where we can use containers um, as a local development environment tool. So yeah, we developed Dusty, has a really cool logo. Um, it's a Python application, it's uh, open source, it's tested. Uh, and what it does is, uh, first of all, kind of like the less interesting part of it is that it uh, manages running Docker on OS X. Um, it, yeah, kind of like abstracts away the pain of having to go through an extra virtual machine before you can run the containers that you want to be able to run. Um, but also in Dusty, we kind of just like developed this whole application and CLI with the use case in mind um, of just like of a, of a local development environment. So we considered a lot of like parts of the workflow that developers commonly need to um, commonly need to perform, and we abstracted some of the details about uh, you know the way you build containers and link them together and run uh, an entire like large stack um, on your local computer. And you know, as I've kind of like focused on in this talk, we really de designed it with this idea of scalability in mind, um, so that we can really increase the size of our stack, add microservices as we want, and make it really easy for our developers to use this tool to run any kind of application that we define um, with Docker on their local environments. Okay, so to kind of summarize um, what I've talked about uh, and what like, I think the takeaways here are, uh, first of all, um, scaling development environments uh, is actually hard to do. It's not a solved problem. Um, and the reason for that is 
the existing tools that people tend to use with their local development environments are kind of flawed solutions. Um, you know, virtual environments, they're not general. Virtual machines, they don't actually scale when we need to run many, many applications. Um, but I hope you guys take away that containers have some properties that make them a very promising tool to use in this way. Um, and I definitely look forward to seeing like, you know, what the um, use cases are that develop for using containers like this. Um, so I ran a little quick, I'm already done. Um, but uh, if you guys uh, like the way a program like Dusty sounds, if it sounds like interesting to run containers as a, um, in your local development environment, you should definitely check out the software we made. I think it's like really cool. You can find it at dusty.gc.com. Uh, it's, again, it's open source, it's written in Python. Um, so yeah, you should go check it out or just talk to me after this. Um, and if, you, if it sounds like you'd like to work on uh, interesting projects like Dusty, you should uh, visit gc.com slash careers and uh, apply to come work at Game Changer. You know, or again, you can just come talk to me uh, after this. Um, cool, I'm done. It sounds like we probably have lots of time for questions. Yeah. If those with questions could come down to the mic here. Thanks a lot. Can you talk for a second about how using Dusty would compare to using, say, Docker Compose plus Docker Machine? Yeah, um, sure, that's a great question. Um, so for those of you guys who don't know, uh, Docker Machine is the virtual machine that I was talking about, which uh, is a Linux virtual machine that runs on your Mac, which allows you to run Docker containers indirectly on your Mac. Uh, Docker Compose is kind of like a tool, I believe it's kind of like marketed um, as helping with some local development environment uh, things. Uh, essentially, it lets you spec out relationships between containers and you know, launch them in a bundle. Um, so Docker Compose is a really cool tool. Uh, the program Dusty that we made actually uses Docker Compose under the hood. Uh, and what makes Dusty different from Docker Compose is that Docker Compose is a much lower level tool than Dusty. Um, yeah, so Docker Compose, uh, basically you write specs, uh, launch apps. Dusty, there's like a, a whole workflow oriented around your development environment and um, like more abstraction and uh, a bunch more features. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question well. If you're uh, looking for some specifics, I definitely encourage you to check out the, um, the description of the, of the tool. Hi there. Hey. So we have a really interesting, um, or a really, yeah, really interesting um, development environment set up at a company that we work at um, in Liberty Village where um, uh, we decided to build our own dev box. And it's just okay. one box, and uh, it has all our tech stack in there. It has like our Mongo database, has our Elasticsearch, has our RabbitMQ, you know, you name it. Sure. And, um, we use a mixture of uh, virtual environment and Docker. Okay. Right? Um, so that, you know, someone can log into the system underneath their user. They don't have sudo. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a virtual environment set up so that they can work. Oh, yeah, the code base is 90% Python. So they can mm -hmm. work in Python um, with all the libraries that they need. And if they need that extra, you know, that extra edge or that extra kick, they can, uh, they can spawn up a Docker container. Sure. Um, to, and, and have their, you know, their uh, product, or sorry, their app isolated in that. Sure. Um, so the problem lies in um, the Docker setup that we're using. I mean, the most typical setup is um, it uses uh, root to be able to access certain resources. Yeah. So even though these, you know, we have everybody log into the system um, mm -hmm. and they're isolated, they don't have sudo, right? Everything's underneath their home directory. Um, they can't, uh, uh, or sorry, they can actually... Um, use Docker to um, gain access to uh, other people's stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, is, uh, which is a little bit of a problem. So we're trying to find a way that um, we can, I don't know if this is really, it's related, but we're trying to find a way that we can uh, somehow configure Docker in a kind of like a secure way um, on an individual box so that we can still leverage the fact that we have one box and all the resources that someone may need might be there. And uh, it's kind of easy to scale too because, you know, the more developers that we have or the more engineers that come in, um, you know, we can just clone this, right? And it's just, it's, uh, it's simple from that perspective. So sure. maybe just some ideas or some thoughts. Um, yeah, so um, it sounds like it would be 
um, a lot of work to move to a, like a solution where someone is running their development environment on their like own computer instead of this shared box. But I mean, obviously, that's one way of um, mitigating this problem where um, it's really hard to, I guess, contain permissions when people are using Docker. Um, you know, one interesting thing about running Docker on Mac, though, um, you know, if you run Docker on Linux, you need root access to run Docker generally, like as far as I know. Um, if you run it on Mac, because Docker is actually running on a virtual machine uh, on Mac, when you run Docker commands, you're actually not running as root anymore. So because Docker is isolated onto the separate virtual machine, um, you know, the user on, you know, directly on OS X, they don't need to be root to talk to that machine. Um, so potentially running Docker inside a virtual machine instead of directly on the host is a way to uh, isolate the permissions there. Um, yeah, I don't know. Those are <laughs> thoughts off the top of my head. Hi, thanks for the talk. Yeah. Um, so you talked about how to spin up a, a container and, and how it, it provides isolation, but in terms of doing development, do you guys spin up the container and then SSH into the container and like run Vim in the container? Or um, Good question. The, the core question is sort of where is your code? Do you, do you yeah. map your code to outside and then edit it from outside and access it from inside? Like yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, we've definitely spent a bunch of time thinking about how to make this work well and like make it a really easy process to use for all of our engineers, even people without a lot of experience. So, um, what we do is you develop code locally on your Mac, and it's in some folder on your Mac. And we set up NFS to link your Mac to your virtual machine. Uh, because otherwise to share like folders between your Mac and your virtual machine, you need to use VirtualBox shared folders or something like that, which is not performant at all. So we use NFS to do that, and then the containers run off um, the code linked by NFS to the virtual machine, if that makes sense. So people are developing code on, yeah, on their Mac, uh, linked via NFS, and then a, a Docker shared folder. Um, yeah, does that answer everything you asked? <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, yeah, in my company, we're working on uh, some similar problems that, that uh, yeah, we're definitely going to check out Dusty. Nice. Uh, so thanks for building it and sharing it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, my question is simple. Um, is it ever useful to combine virtual env and Docker? Um, it's not something that we've done. Uh, I feel like once you're using Docker, it provides all the isolation and more that you get with a virtual environment. So I don't know why you need to use it um, if you're already spinning up containers. Like, there's not a lot of overhead in Docker that you avoid um, by using a virtual environment. I think the the use case for virtual environments that like I use day to day is just when I'm like doing something quick that you know, doesn't require me to spin up a Docker container, I still like, um, you know, just like offhand like spin up a virtual environment or something like that. But in terms of like, um, a use case in this like, big developed, in, de developed environment tool, um, you know, if you're already using Docker, I'm not sure why you need to add virtual environments to those. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Let's give another thanks to our speaker.